Hey guys, so if you're new here or if you're not, if you want to hear me voice act, head over to our main channel, links down below. And if you don't, this channel's solely for TTS. Um, if you want to know all the details about what's going on, we have a stream up that you can go and watch, but let's just get into the video. Lizard Folk 18, Tragedy and Triumph. Be me, Lizard DM. Be not me, Lizard Folk Fighter, Lizard Folk Cleric. Lizard Folk Sorcerer, Lizard Folk Paladin, Goblin Rogue. The party leave the ruins that almost claimed their lives, pockets full of gold and trinkets. The Sorcerer's magic fatigue has passed but he's now heavily invested in trying to figure out just what each of the sticks do. Spends almost every single rest looking over as many as possible. So far, he's identified 5 sticks, though not necessarily the spells attached. 2 are healing. One is necromancy, one is abjuration and one contains a magic he doesn't know of. Party making their way to Noxva Keep, getting closer with each passing day. In fact, as they get closer, they begin to notice changes in the land around them. Villages are becoming less and less frequent. The days seem to be going past faster, the nights stretching far longer than natural. The vegetation has a sickly, decayed look about it and everything from the water to the air itself has a horrible aftertaste. Needless to say, the party are fairly confident they're getting close. The party are making their watches more and more vigilant, and their dreams are disturbed by distant sounds of howls and shifting in nearby woods. They continue through this dead land, heading west where they know Nox the Keep resides. As the sun of the fourth day in this land falls below the horizon, the party set up their watch while trying their best to sleep. On the second watch, the cleric sits with the paladin, scanning the featureless land around them. A patch of mostly dead trees resides about 200 meters away, a potential escape route if things should go south. The cleric is looking around when he hears the sound of snapping branches. He looks over, but his eyes are unable to pierce the darkness. He grabs the ranger's crossbow out of his pack and loads a bolt, just in case. The paladin scans around, occasionally checking over the rest of the sleeping party. Which is when they hear it. The crunching of dead grass under heavy feet. Moving fast. Headed right for them. The cleric casts light on the crossbow bolt and raises it in the direction of the sound, the paladin lifting his axe. The paladin reaches down and grabs a rock casting light on it before tossing it in the direction of the running. The light passes over a dark shape, low to the ground and moving fast. Just before the cleric pulls the trigger, the creature comes into the light. He yanks his hand to the side just in time to barely avoid hitting the wolf that stood in front of them. The paladin looks cautiously at the cleric, who slowly kneels down. Hello friend. Are you okay? He slowly reaches out a hand towards the wolf's head. He stops his hand when it begins growling, fur puffing up and teeth baring. Friend. You are not okay. The player looks at me and pauses. I'd like to cast animal friendship. He raises his hand, and the faintest smell of pine nettles and a soft breeze passes through the air between them. The wolf tilts its head, its fur slowly flattening. The cleric smiles and goes to extend his hand. He nearly gets to it when the wolf suddenly twitches, as if struck by electricity, and its eyes suddenly cloud. He realizes a split second too late that something is incredibly wrong before the wolf is suddenly on him, pushing him to the ground and trying to tear out his throat with its teeth. He shoves it off of him, but it snarls, rushing in again and sinking its teeth into his arm. The paladin rushes in, swinging his axe before the cleric can even say a word. The axe buries itself in the wolf's side, and the cleric yells out as the paladin hits it with a smite. With a high-pitched whine of pain, the wolf is thrown off of the cleric, and hits the ground, its body heaving with unstable breaths and blood pouring out of it. The cleric runs over to it, putting his hand on its fur. The wolf, too injured to fight back, whines in pain. The paladin steps forward, raising his axe. We should put it out of its misery. The cleric turns to him. No his fault. Help him. Paladin sighs. I thought you were supposed to lack empathy. It's clearly done, and it would be cruel to let it die slowly. The cleric shakes his head and goes to cast cure wounds at second level. The wounds don't close. 
He looks over, seeing that the eyes have gone misty and its body has stopped heaving. The wolf is dead. The cleric player, absolutely distraught, begins looking through his inventory, desperately searching for a diamond. He doesn't have one. He puts his hand on the wolf and, ignoring the paladin stares, repeatedly casts healing spells on it. Nothing works. The cleric slowly rises to his feet, where the rest of the party now gathers, having been woken by the commotion. The rogue slowly walks past the cleric and looks at the still body of the wolf. He turns to the paladin. What did he do? The paladin slowly looks down at his axe, covered in blood. It was going to kill him. I had to stop it. He looks at the cleric. I'm so sorry. I had to do it. Cleric shakes his head. Do nothing now. Soul hunt in beastlands. I helped before. Help again. The cleric looks at the rest of the party. No eat. I use him. Party nod. They only watch as the cleric slowly picks up the body of the wolf and walks away to the woods. The paladin goes to follow him. But the rogue grabs his arm. Don't. Let him do this. The cleric walks deep into the woods before stopping at what looks like an old tree. He kneels next to it, placing the body in front of him. He takes a leaf out of a pocket and chews it. He places his hands on the wolf and closes his eyes. Ancient one. I call upon you now. Ensure this warrior's passage to the beastlands. Give me the strength to fight the monsters that hurt your children. My friends, they serve different beings, but do not let that sway you. Do not take revenge on the one who struck down your child. Take revenge on the one who forced him to land the blow. Let me be your vessel in this. After a few moments, the cleric feels a warm breeze on his face, and the smell of pine around him. He opens his eyes, seeing the land around him has changed. The once dead trees are now alive. The ground beneath him is full of lush grass. The sky that once held the moon now holds a bright spring sun and he can hear the sounds of birds in the trees. He looks in front of him, seeing the wolf gone. He looks around, and besides one of the trees, sees it standing, looking up at a figure beside it. The figure stands well over 12 feet tall. Made of gnarled wood, the figure is humanoid in nature, but with overly long arms and horns that curve up from its head and down beside its elongated face. Its hands end in long, wooden claws, and red eyes burn in the wood of the face. The ancient one turns and walks away, the wolf following obediently beside it. The cleric blinks and the vision is gone. The trees are once again dead, casting long shadows across the dry ground. The wolf's body is still there. The cleric smiles and exits the woods, returning to the party. The night passes, and they continue their journey west, the cleric now filled with a burning passion for vengeance. A feeling that was once alien to him, and perhaps not belonging to him at all. Two days later, they see it. The looming shape of Dark Peak Mountain. It's an intimidating thing. Made almost entirely of black stone with jagged edges and steep cliffs, it appears almost unnatural. Like the physical embodiment of the evil in Isopin. A twisted and deadly dark spire. There is no life between where they are in the mountain. No trees, no grass. Nothing but dirt and stone stretching for kilometers. And beneath that dark peak, even from this distance, they could see the shape of Noxva Keep. As beautiful as it was eerie, the structure was a dark building with towering spires and graceful bridges. As the rogue looks at it, his fists slowly clench. Now we get to see how you feel when your home is taken from you. Nobody notices that, as soon as Noxva Keep comes into sight, all color drains from the paladin scales, and his body becomes incredibly stiff. It's like he's staring death in the eyes. The party decide to make camp a little distance away, out of sight of the castle behind a small outcropping of black rock. They rest there as night falls, more on edge now than they had ever been, even when they had known Milana was after them. The rogue and fighter are on the first watch, and as the pale moon comes over the horizon, the land becomes somehow even creepier. As they wait on watch, the rogue notices the paladin twitching in his sleep. Staring and rolling around, his eyes are moving quickly under his eyelids. Which is when I ask everyone to leave the room. I can't disclose what happens yet. But as the paladin sits there, I describe his dream. 
I invite the other players back in, and they sit there, eyeing the paladin with incredible suspicion. However, as intent the rogue is on looking at the paladin, he doesn't hear the faintest of footprints. The fighter rolls a perception check. 12. He doesn't hear anything as a figure, ever so slowly, crawls their way down the side of the stone they rest behind. Then the rogue looks up. He sees deep red eyes, sitting in a familiar pale face framed by dark hair. Milona. He opens his mouth to scream and she smiles, pouncing on him. Chaos. The fighter gets to his feet, swinging his battle axe at the crazed vampire spawn attacking his friend. Milana catches his arm and backhands him, sending him sprawling to the ground. She pins the rogue's arms to the ground and her smile grows impossibly wide, showing off her jagged teeth. You're all mine little goblin. She bites him, and he lets out a horrible scream as his legs flail uselessly. The party wakes, seeing the she-demon huddled over their struggling friend. The cleric raises his hand and launches a guiding bolt, but with his sleepiness, he misses the shot. The sorcerer gets up, hitting her with magic missile. She hisses and slowly rises to her feet, glaring at him. That's when the paladin rises to his feet. She stares at him and tilts her head. Then, her grin grows even wider. Kurochi purrs. He growls at her and raises his axe, swinging at her with fury. She dodges both and laughs, before the fighter cuts her off with a battle axe to the back. She slashes the cleric across the chest with her claws before dashing forward, closing her hand around the sorcerer's throat and pinning him to the stone. He goes to raise his hand, but she grabs it, wrenching it to the side, breaking his wrist. The rogue, weak and holding his neck, stumbles to his knees, and after fumbling for a moment, launches a crossbow bolt into her back. She ignores it. The cleric summons the sword and swings it, tearing into her back. She growls and slashes at him, but he deflects the blow. The sorcerer growls, and as Milana laughs, he tries desperately to hit her. He then drops a hand to his side, his fingers glowing briefly before they land on his skin. Milana frowns as his scales begin to shake, shifting from their normal green to a deep red. The sorcerer growls, and a small grin grows across his face. The party watch in awe and confusion as he grabs her, and opening his mouth, launches a jet of flame directly into her face. Screaming, she falls to the ground in front of him, hair lit on fire and face scorched. The sorcerer stands over her, red scales on full display even as he grins down at her. The paladin, not wanting to waste a moment, brings his axe up, slamming it into her back. Crit because she's prone. Milana screams as she's hit with the power of a thousand suns, and is forced to the ground. The paladin brings it up again and slams it down. Another second level smite. Her screams sound almost animal-like at this point. She begins to crawl away, trying desperately to escape the pain. She gets to her feet and tries to run. Opportunity attack from fighter. I want to use my opportunity attack to trip her. Rolls. Nat 20. She stumbles over his outstretched leg and collapses to the ground. He stands over and brings the axe down twice. Barely recognizable anymore, she tries to crawl away one last time. She's stopped when the rogue crouches down in front of her, sword held in front of him. You're all mine, vampire. He brings the sword down and brings it down, impaling her through the head. Milana's lizard folk scale covered hand twitches as her body slowly falls still, the vampire spawn finally dead. Table goes bloody insane. Then the fighter turns to the paladin. She know you. Paladin freezes. Fighter gets up in his face, bringing his axe up. She know you. Who are you, fleshy? Rogue steps in between the two significantly taller lizard folk. Hey, hey, chill. Milana is dead. The bitch who killed two of you, who killed me, is finally f king dead and this guy helped us do it. Fighter looks at him but doesn't say anything. Like it or not, he has the power to kill them. We have a chance now. We can storm into Nox the Keep, kill every single bastard in our way and bury our swords and teeth into high water. Do not throw away that chance. Rogue pauses and turns on the paladin. However, you have some explaining to do. If there's even the slightest chance you'll turn on us, 
We'll make sure you look just like her. He points at Milana with the sword. Paladin pauses before sighing. I'll explain. He sits down, and reluctantly, the rest of the party follow. The cleric slowly reaches over and touches the sorcerer, frowning as he does so. What happened to your scales? What did she do to you? Sorcerer shakes his head. She did nothing. I have dragon's blood in me. It gives me my power, just as Semuana gives you yours. Semuana is the lizard folk god of survival. Basically, they go to god. Cleric nods but says nothing. Party turn to Paladin, who breathes in heavily before speaking. As far as I know, I was born in the swamp, just as you were. I was not raised there though. My egg was taken by human smugglers. They sold me to... To someone very powerful. That person let me hatch, and they... Tried to teach me. They wanted to know if our kind could be taught to be one of theirs. They wanted to see if they could train us. Rogue. Did it work? Paladin pauses. To an extent. I knew I was different but didn't know anything about my kind for years of my life. I wholeheartedly believed I was just one of them. I might have lived my entire life there, if it weren't for the Knights of Purgation. They invaded my home, killing many and suffering many losses. They found me there and took me out. I've never looked back, but... The people that lived there always remembered. They always searched for me. The sorcerer, his scales slowly returning to their normal color, nods. You high waters pet. The paladin turns to him and nods slowly. I was his plaything. His little experiment. I was allowed to escape, and now I'm back. Right where he wants me. Rogue looks at him and places a hand on his leg. He won't get you. We won't let him. You have the power to fight back now. We're going to kill him. We're going to pay him back from everything he's taken from us. That's when they hear a soft voice above them. Don't be so sure. They whip around, seeing a pale man garbed in expensive clothing standing on the rock above them. They draw their weapons and back away, all lizard folk but the paladin growling. The man laughs. Those won't help you. The cleric's hand begins to glow, and he raises it, pointing at the man. Who you? The man raises an eyebrow. Why, I thought after all of your talk of revenge you would recognize my face. I, my illiterate friend, am Baron Ardenus Highwater. He turns his head to Curate and smiles, revealing jagged teeth. Curate, so good to see you. You've grown so much since we last met. Curate growls at him. Highwater laughs. Really? You spend a few weeks with your kind and you've already taken on their trays. After all the time I spent teaching you, I almost feel insulted. You stole my life. I should have been with my people. High water size. Your people? They call you fleshy, which I can only presume is intended to be an insult in the eyes of these savages. You are as much one of them as I am a goblin. He looks at the rogue, as if noticing him for the first time. Speaking of which, you're with an odd crowd, aren't you? I suppose monsters attract monsters. The rogue raises the sword, eyes burning with anger. You call me a monster again and I'll ram this so far up your ass it'll come out your mouth. Highwater raises an eyebrow. Charming. Really cure it. Could you not have chosen a more civilized crew of individuals to aid you on your crusade? It's almost insulting. Paladin. Shut up. What are you doing here? Are you going to kill us? Highwater shrugs. Maybe. If the mood strikes me, I might enjoy the brief moment of fun that comes from mending your pitiful existences, however, I feel the effort alone wouldn't be worth it, you're far too weak to challenge me. The cleric releases the guiding bolt he'd been holding during the entire conversation. Raising a hand to his mouth as if he were yawning, Highwater dodges out of the way. Pathetic really. Well, I suppose I'd best be letting you have your rest. You've got a big day tomorrow. I do hope you do come see me, the castle can get so boring without your presence cure it. As he goes to turn away, the rogue slowly whispers under his breath. For Corley. With that, he lifts his crossbow, and releases a shot right into Highwater's back. Highwater hisses and slowly turns. He looks over his shoulder and yanks out the bolt, peering at it curiously before tossing it aside. 
Please, don't disrupt my clothing. This was specifically tailored for me and far too expensive to be ruined by a lesser creature. With that, he turns away, and as the party watch, his back begins to shift and crack. With looks of horror, they see his bone shift, and with a horrible scraping, immense bat wings protrude from his back. I do hope to see you tomorrow curate. I would be disappointed if you left. With a flap of his immense wings, High Water then takes off into the air, buffeting the party with cold wind as he disappears into the night. Game ends. Be me, Lizard DM. Be not me, Lizard Folk Fighter, Lizard Folk Cleric, Lizard Folk Sorcerer, Lizard Folk Paladin, Goblin Rogue. Party watch as High Water flies off, his bat like wings rasping with every beat. Curate drops his axe and slumps to the ground. This was a mistake. Rogue. What do you mean? The paladin turns to him. I'm not sure if you saw what I saw, but high water is far too strong for us to fight. We won't even be able to get close to him. The rogue suddenly laughs. That's where I think you're wrong. He had us here, tired, and at his mercy, and he did nothing. He's scared. He knows he won't beat us in a fair fight. He wants us to go through all of his minions before we fight him, because then he knows he'll win. Cleric, we lose life to Milona. We lose life to him. Rogue shrugs, I'm not afraid to die. But consider it. Milona attacked us again and again. She ran away, yes, but at least she attacked us. If high water is so powerful, why wouldn't he even try? Fighter, we no go through gate. We avoid fight until high water. Force him fight head on. Party agree to this, and decide to sleep. Confident enough that high water won't attack them in their sleep that they don't organize a watch. As they wake, they are happy to find that they seem untouched, only reinforcing the rogue's forced confidence. The party look out at Nox the Keep, admiring the towering spires and dark walls. Paladin, are you sure we want to do this? He knows we're coming, and he'll expect us to try sneak in. Party nod. Cleric, I know Diamond. If die, stay dead. Party nod again, condemning themselves to the threat of death. They make their way across the several kilometers of open ground towards the castle walls, the party prying the paladin's mind for any details he may remember. I pass him several notes. There aren't any grim the knights during the day, but he has several other types of guards and defenses. The main keep is extremely defended, and a lot of the grim the knights will be staying there, waiting for us. The keep stretches inside of the mountain, so we can't get in by air. The party gets about 300 meters away from the main gate and stop, looking at the walls. Cleric turns to me. Is there any cover we could use? The land is featureless except Dark Peak Mountain. There's no way to remain hidden from scouts on the wall unless you were invisible. The party look at the sorcerer. He thinks for a moment. I have plan. We'll need timing and use many spells. Party listen to it and after agreeing, set it into motion, and thus beginning the siege of Nox the Keep. They begin to walk towards the castle, getting closer and closer. They notice that the portcullis is open, inviting them inside. They get about 120 feet away when the sorcerer returns to me. I want to cast distant spell major image, depicting us continuing to walk in the same positions as we are now. The illusion walks in time with them, not visible to anyone. The rogue climbs onto the fighter's back immediately, not even pausing to check if the illusion is place. Sorcerer, I want a twin third level invisibility. The party snap out of vision, leaving their duplicates walking towards the castle. I know both spells are concentration, but I allowed it because rule of cool and I wanted to see what would happen. Now invisible, the party begins sprinting around the side of the castle, their duplicates continuing to walk into the castle. Knowing that the range is only 240 feet, the sorcerer keeps relatively close to the illusion for as long as possible. Then arrows begin raining down on the illusion from unseen positions. Sorcerer makes it look like the illusion started casting spells, taking cover behind new illusions. It's all very intricate. He then makes his version of the sorcerer raise its hand, before dispelling the illusion, as if they had all gone invisible. Not caring to see the results, the party make their way around the wall, 
headed to the base of Dark Peak Mountain. They reach it, hearing shouts of warning inside the walls as presumably, guards began to look for their illusions. As they stand beside the sheer black rock, they look up, realizing there is no hope to climb it. The rogue, wanting to keep the party moving, activates the second part of their plan. Still on the fighter's back, he casts Tensor's floating disc beside the wall. They climb on top, and the other invisible members of the party begin tying their rope around and under it. The sorcerer, using his final third level spell slot, casts fly on himself, grabbing the rope and flies up, making it to the top of the wall. Looking around, he sees a few guards, mostly of undead nature, standing at posts, but as he's holding the rope, it is invisible. The rogue casts Unseen Servant, which grabs the rope, alongside Mage Hand. The Sorcerer, now with the aid of an Unseen Servant and both his and the rogue's Mage Hands, begins to pull on the rope. Slowly, their makeshift elevator rises, eventually cresting at the wall. The party scramble over it. With a lot of help from high stealth rolls, the party climb down the wall and sprint towards the main keep, avoiding several undead guards and the bailers. With barely a few minutes to spare on his fly, the party set up their elevator again, the rogue using the last of his first level spell slots to do so. They begin traversing up the side of the keep, allotting on a small balcony about three stories up. The rogue casts message on the paladin. Where to now? I ask the paladin to roll a straight intelligence check. 13. I I need to get my bearings first. It's familiar but I haven't been here in years. They enter the keep through a small door, opening it as silently as they can before closing it behind them. They're in. They begin sneaking around the halls of the keep, an expansive and highly decorated structure. Every other room they pass is a dining hall, or ballroom or simply a makeshift museum of sorts. The building screams wealth. At the party's request, the cleric casts death ward on himself, effectively saving him from death for the next 8 hours. As they navigate the seemingly endless halls, the party hear a series of footsteps ahead of them. They freeze as a pair of heavily armored vampire spawn walk past them, making their way down the corridor. The party begin to move off again, rolling their stealth checks. Which of course, is when the sorcerer rolls a natural one. As the party begin to slowly sneak past, his foot accidentally nudges a suit of armor resting on a pedestal and with an unholy racket. It clashes to the floor, the sound reverberating around the halls. The vampire spawn whirl around, crossbow and battle axe gleaming. The rogue, thinking fast, jumps off the fighter's back, foot raised off the ground, in a stereotypical sneaking fashion. RFCK. Well hi there, you wouldn't mind forgetting you ever saw me, huh? The vampire spawn chuckle and the one with the axe walks forward, the smallest flicker of electricity moving along its blade. The rogue chuckles nervously and begins to back away, doing some amazing acting as the rest of the invisible party begin encircling the two grim knights. The goblin raises his crossbow and points it at the guard's face, who is unaware that the fighter and cleric stand invisibly beside him. Take one more step and you're going to regret it. To the guard's credit, he pauses. You're going to shoot me, goblin? Yes. The one with the crossbow laughs. Even if there are reinforcements already on their way? The rogue nods. Then I suppose we'd best make this quick then. Axe guy raises an eyebrow. We? Which of course is when the fighter brings his axe into the guy's leg, embedding it in the back of his knee. The cleric, not wanting to waste spell slots just yet, shoves the axe vamp, pushing him to the ground. He then raises a hand axe and buries it into the guy's back. The crossbow vampire goes to release a shot but is interrupted as the sorcerer appears, swinging a dagger at his face, casting green flame blade in the same movement. The dagger stabs into the guy's forehead, burning hot with green flames that singe his head. The paladin then follows it up by bringing his own axe into the guy's back, hitting him with a first level smite. The rogue runs forward, throwing his crossbow to the side and drawing his short sword before repeatedly stabbing the downed vampire spawn in the bag like a maniac. He rolls high, and the vampire's screams are quickly cut off by the fevered stabbing. The crossbow vampire slashes his claws across the sorcerer's chest before backing up, barely avoiding a swing from the paladin. 
he shoots his crossbow, which the paladin barely avoids. The bolt embeds itself in the wall, cracking the stone and sending ice billowing from the impact. The fighter runs in, burying his axe in the vampire spawn shoulder, before swinging again into the guy's neck. The vampire begins choking, but not before the cleric picks up the axe dropped by the other one and slams it into his chest. Even without being attuned to it, the axe is magical, and the cleric gives a grunt of satisfaction as the axe sends the vampire to his knees. The sorcerer walks up, dagger glowing with green fire. He jams it under the vampire's jaw, killing him instantly. As the body drops, the party look around at each other. Rogue, holy shit we're awesome. The cleric and the fighter swap axes, and the rogue grabs the crossbow. The paladin watches them do this before snapping his fingers. We don't have much time. There are reinforcements coming. Grab what you want and let's get out of here. Agreeing with his logic, the party quickly head off, now equipped with unattuned magical weapons. As they sprint through the halls, now visible, they come across several other Grimner knights, all of which are dealt with in relative speed. The party isn't left intact, however. Having taken several hits, the party is getting low on spell slots for healing and not one of them has full health. After fighting about 8 vampire spawn in total, the party finally reach a large wooden door, engraved with silver and gold. The paladin stops everyone. High water is beyond this door. He undoubtedly knows we're coming, so everyone, stay sharp. The rogue turns to everyone. If I die here, please, find my people and tell them I did it for them, okay? The cleric leans forward, placing a hand on his shoulder. We tell them. If die, please protect Swamp. He reaches behind him, grabbing a bone dagger from a makeshift belt. He pulls out a metal dagger and begins picking at it, engraving draconic symbols in its side. He then hands it to the rogue, who looks at it oddly. What does it say? You one of us now. Tells village protects you. Treat a small lizard folk. The rogue gets a small tear in his eye but not, putting the dagger in his belt. Thank you. The fighter turns to the paladin. I sorry. I wrong. You just lizard folk as me. The paladin smiles briefly before placing his hand on the door. Ready? The party nod. The paladin pushes open the door, revealing a huge hall, lit by candles of blue fire, and decorated not unlike the interior of a church. At the back, where the altar may have resided, is a large throne, upon which sits Baron Highwater. His elegant and expensive clothing is gone, replaced by a suit of iron plate armor, leaving only his head unarmored. As he watches the party get closer, he begins to slowly applaud them. Congratulations. I would say I was impressed but admittedly, that would be lying. I always expected you would make it here. The paladin raises his axe. Are you going to sit there all day or are you going to get up and fight? Highwater raises an eyebrow. Well that's rude of you. I always thought I taught you to have better manners than that. The rogue raises his crossbow. Come on coward. Let's see how good you are against people who can actually fight back. Highwater turns to him, looking him up and down. I'm sorry, but am I supposed to know you? All goblins look alike to me. You destroyed my village and killed my wife you bastard. Highwater waves his hand dismissively. I've destroyed many villages and killed countless wives, you're nothing special. But if that serves as your driving force, who am I to disregard that? As they're talking the fighter has been using his ability know your enemy. I finally pass him a note, and when he reads over it, his eyes go wide. OFCK. Party look at him. He's got 10 levels in cleric. He's a spillcaster. Just then, Highwater yawns and looks at the paladin. You know, cure it. I was hoping you'd come to my side willingly, however, if that isn't going to happen. His eyes suddenly glow a fierce red. Wisdom saving throw. 19. The paladin's eyes briefly glow the same red before he shakes his head, dismissing the effect. The paladin turns to the rest of the party. Enough of this. Get that mother Efka. Highwater suddenly stands and claps his hands. The party watch as the floor they had been standing on suddenly blossoms with a wave of dark energy, creating a 60 foot radius. Alright then, show me what you've got, 
Savages. Roll initiative. The cleric raises his hand, releasing a guiding bolt at him. He laughs as he easily dodges it, walking closer. The fighter runs in, axe raised. He swings it, cutting open Highwater's side. He flips it and swings at the other side. Highwater grabs the handle and pushes it away. Action surge. He swings the axe again, which Highwater steps out of the way of. He then swings at Highwater's leg. I want to expend a superiority die to trip him. Strength save. He hooks the axe head around Highwater's heel and yanks back with all of his strength. Highwater raises his foot, and the axe comes loose, almost tripping the fighter in the process. His eyes go wide as Highwater raises one of his hands, summoning a mace. The mace cracks into his side, tossing him aside like a leaf in the wind. The rogue releases a shot into Highwater's shoulder, and another into his chest. Highwater laughs, and moves closer. The sorcerer, expending some of his first level spells to make a third level, blasts Highwater with a lightning bolt, which lights up his body like a Christmas tree. Highwater sighs and taps the mace against the ground. The party watch as ethereal claws begin to scratch at the ground around him, before pulling themselves out of the stone. Fiendish creatures begin swirling around him, claws swinging and teeth biting. The paladin at the start of his turn rolls a wisdom saving throw. 19. The claws tear at him, opening cuts all over his body. He realizes what the radius is for now. Everyone inside is vulnerable to necrotic damage. Even if you succeed a save, you take full damage. He growls, and runs forward, swinging his axe wildly. Highwater deflects the first strike with the mace, but grunts as the second strike buries itself under his ribs. First level smite. Highwater's confident grin sours slightly as the radiant energy courses into him. He swings the mace, cracking it into the paladin's leg. The paladin yells out and falls to one knee. The cleric thinks for a moment and, holding out his own axe, closes his eyes. The spirits of other lizard folk begin to swirl around him, including the barbarian, and now, the ranger. He walks to the paladin's side, staying out of reach of the fiends, but overlapping the paladin in his own aura. Highwater looks at the spirits and chuckles. Cute. The fighter appears behind him, swinging his axe into Highwater's back. Highwater grunts, swinging the mace behind him, cracking the stone as it impacts the floor where the fighter used to be. The rogue runs in, leaping off the paladin hunched over back and onto high water. This is for call you mother Fka. He begins to stab high water repeatedly in the shoulder and chest. The damage of the sword, on top of the sneak attack bonus given by his friend's proximity is more than enough to hurt high water a lot. High water yells out as the fiends dissipate, and those bat wings rip from the back of his armor, extending. He takes off the ground, using his legendary action to avoid opportunity attacks. I give the rogue the chance to get off this wild ride. FCK that. I don't care if I die, I'm taking this bastard with me. And so, still clinging on like some demented possum or koala, the rogue is lifted into the air on high water's shoulders. The sorcerer looks at the pair, now in the air, and raises his hand, letting out a magic missile. The missiles curve around the rogue, slamming into high water. High water grabs the rogue's leg and with a little shriek, the rogue is held in front of him. As he watches, he sees high water's mouth begin to grow impossibly wide, and his teeth enlarge. That wasn't very smart, now is it? The rogue screams as high water leans over and bites him, burying his teeth into the flesh of his neck. The rogue is knocked unconscious. His eyes go wide as I tell him how much his maximum HP is dropped by, due to the vulnerability to necrotic. More than half of his maximum health is gone. Another bite like that would kill him for certain. Highwater drops his motionless body to the ground, and the party cringe as I describe the crunch his body makes it when it hits the ground. The paladin immediately runs over to him, and shares his lay on hands, buffing himself and sending most of it into the rogue. The rogue gasps as his eyes snap open, and he grabs his neck, which is still pumping blood. High water floats even higher, until he's 60 feet in the air. The cleric summons his sword, which appears in the air beside high water. High water turns to it before the sword slashes into him, sending him reeling. 
The fighter runs over and grabs the rogue's new crossbow. Will give back. The rogue nods weakly. He raises it and after closing one eye, releases a shot. The shot hits one of the rafters. The rogue gets up and refuses the crossbow from the fighter. Instead, his hands glow and he launches a firebolt, which blasts high water in the chest. The sorcerer, after thinking a moment, he expends his fourth level slot to create a third level and a first level. I want a twin fly. Using all but his final sorcerer point, he points at the paladin, who turns to him and nods. High water's wounds begin to heal, and with a grin, he summons the floating circle of fiends around him once more. The paladin, with a growl, takes off the ground, rising into the sky. The cleric walks over to the fighter, healing him with cure wounds before making another swing at high water with the sword. High water, expecting it this time, deflects it with ease. He raises his hand, and a bolt of light streaks towards the cleric. The cleric dives out of the way, barely avoiding the shot. The fighter, now using the rogue's crossbow launches two shots into the air, one of which hits the rafters and the other is barely deflected off of high water's armor. High water launches a second bolt of light, which the paladin barely dodges. The rogue shoots another firebolt which strikes the grinning vampire in the face. The sorcerer takes into the air, and now 30 feet away turns to me. I want to use my final sorcerer point to cast distant spell dragon breath. The sorcerer's scales shift from their normal green to red, and opening his mouth wide, he launches a jet of flame. The jet engulfs high water, who yells out in pain, his eyes glaring full of hate at the sorcerer below him. High water's wounds begin to close some more and he throws his mace, which floats down a bit before slamming into the sorcerer, concaving his chest and knocking the wind out of him. Rolls a constitution saving throw. He drops a bit, but barely maintains his concentration, keeping he and the paladin airborne. High water, seeing it didn't work, opens his arms wide. A high pitched screech echoes from his mouth and the party have to hold their hands over their ears for a moment. The nearby walls fill with the sound of clawing and squeaks. Rogue. Oh that's not good. The paladin, ignoring the screeches, flies up to high water, staring him in the eyes before swinging his axe. Nat 20. Second level smite. Having saved his second level spells for this fight, the paladin unleashes all of the years of his torment into one single swing. The axe buries itself in high water's chest, and the vampire screams as radiant energy blasts into him. The sphere of fiends dissipates immediately, and the paladin gets closer. He swings at the wings, but realizing what he's doing, high water closes them, dropping out of the air momentarily before opening them back up to keep him airborne. The cleric begins moving his sword and then launches a guiding bolt, which strikes the vampire in the back. High water suddenly flies over to the sorcerer, getting closer with each beat of his wings. The fighter launches another two crossbow bolts, one of which hits high water in the leg. The rogue taps on the fighter's shoulder and points to the walls, where they can see small eyes beginning to peer out of. He shoots a firebolt at the wall, illuminating a small crevice. Inside, he sees what looks like hundreds of bats. OFCK. Brace yourselves. The sorcerer releases a jet of flames into high water's face, and tries to back away, getting a claw to his chest for his troubles. Which is when the walls seem to explode. A seemingly endless stream of bats swarms out from countless holes, flying into the hall in a swirling cloud of fangs and claws. The rogue, fighter and cleric are assaulted by the bats, before another swarm begin making their way up towards high water to assist in his airborne battle. High water grabs the sorcerer and raises his hand, which begins to glow with black energy. Die you pathetic monster. He swings his fist, catching the sorcerer across the face. A fifth level inflict wounds on a target vulnerable to necrotic energy. The sorcerer goes unconscious immediately, and begins falling through the air, the paladin letting out a cry as he begins to follow. The rogue looks up, expending a second spell slot to cast Feather Fall on the two falling teammates. The paladin tries to strafe through the air and ends up clinging onto high water. I'm not done with you. He pulls a dagger out of a sheath and begins lacerating the vampire's wings, taking a claw to the face for his troubles. The two of them, 
clinging to each other, begin falling. The cleric casts second level healing word on the sorcerer before turning on the bats, swinging wildly with his axe. The fighter begins cleaving at the bats around him, smacking them out of the air left and right. The rogue, looking very poor, begins slashing at the bats with his sword, trying desperately to stay alive. The sorcerer, opening his eyes, realizes that he's slowly falling and is almost entirely out of spell slots. He sees the swarm of bats coming towards him, and making a decision, raises his hand, releases a second level magic missile. The missiles strike several of the bats out of the air, another few blasting into high water, who is still grappling with the paladin above him, both falling slower due to the paladin's feather fall. The bats on the ground are almost dead, but the ones in the air are only just entering the battle, swarming around the falling pair and the sorcerer. The sorcerer is almost dropped unconscious again even as the paladin is lacerated. Highwater raises his fist, smashing it into the face of the paladin. Second level inflict wounds. Luckily for the paladin, he rolls low, but even still, the paladin spits out several teeth and is left extremely bloody. The paladin wriggles out of high water's grip and stands up. See you later mother Efka. He jumps. The feather fall was exclusive to the paladin, and as soon as his feet are no longer touching high water, the vampire begins to fall at breakneck speed. He hits the ground with a crunch. The paladin grabs his axe and begins slicing at the bats around him, taking out most in his frenzy. The cleric looks over to see Highwater slowly climb to his feet before he holds out his hand. Using his final second level slot, he runs over to Highwater, leaping into the air and striking him with a sword, the spirits of the lizard folk still swirling around him. The vampire, who isn't looking so great anymore, turns to him in time to take the sword strike across his face. He roars in pain as a large cut opens from his right eye to his left jaw. The fighter clears the remaining bats around he and the rogue, realizing too late that it means he can't get to height water. He looks over at the rogue. Get your revenge. He expends his final superiority die to use rally. The rogue nods, sprinting towards high water, a mere 12 HP left after being given temporary hit points. He runs in, slashing Highwater's leg as he passes before getting behind him and impaling him through the back. Highwater roars, swinging at the cleric with a clawed hand. The cleric barely avoids the strike. The sorcerer, now barely a few feet above the ground, uses his final spell slot to hit Highwater with a magic missile. The vampire, extremely weak, slowly begins to heal before the spirits launch into him, tearing at his flesh. All of his healing is gone. He glares up at the cleric and raises his hand, which begins to glow with necrotic energy. I will not be bested by you. I will not die. He swings his hand. The fourth level inflict wounds hits the cleric directly across the face. With his necrotic vulnerability, the cleric can do nothing as he takes 88 necrotic damage directly to the face. He falls to the ground, unmoving. Highwater laughs. The paladin still falling slowly, yells out, but is unable to do anything. Highwater turns and backhands the rogue, sending him to the ground unconscious. The fighter steps forward, swinging his axe in a rage. Highwater dodges both strikes before returning with one of his own, his claws tearing into the fighter's side. The sorcerer lands and grabs his dagger, running in. He stabs Highwater in the back with the dagger, sending green fire licking up his back. Highwater lets out a yell and collapses to his knees. The sorcerer reaches over and grabs the fighter's axe. You no hurt friend anymore, monster. He swings the axe, burying it into Highwater's skull. Highwater's body slowly crumples to the ground. The paladin finally touches down, and sprints to the rogue's side. Using his final spell slot, he heals the rogue, who sits up rapidly. He looks around him, and seeing the cleric motionless on the ground, grabs his short sword, ramming into Highwater's corpse over and over. Nobody stops him. After he's gotten out all of his anger, the rogue collapses to his knees, tears streaming down his face. We did it Corley. We did it. Then the cleric coughs. The party look over to him as he rolls over onto his back, long claw marks down the length of his face and his chest barely heaving. Did. Did do it? The fighter walks over and picks him up, 
putting an arm under his shoulder. The cleric player looks at the table. I am so glad you told me to use death ward on myself, I swear to god. Party look around at the desolate hall, the ground littered with bat bodies and blood. Rogue. Holy shit. We did it. Game ends. No tabletop RPG is complete without beautiful models on the table and the best place to get models is from us. If you check the link below we have everything you could need for your magical realm. Only the finest of big titty wafers here. But if you're not into models or don't play with models we got you covered with subclasses such as the Gachimashi Wizards, the Simp Warlock and the North FC Fighter. Also we have started selling 5th edition adventures with our first one featuring Belle Delphine, the succubus that has poisoned the town's well and turned the villagers into simps. If any of that stuff sounds fun to you go ahead and check the link below but let's get back to the video. Be me, Lizard DM. Be not me, Lizard Folk Fighter, Lizard Folk Cleric, Lizard Folk Sorcerer, Lizard Folk Paladin, Goblin Rogue. Having just killed Baron Highwater, the party is tired, almost entirely out of spell slots and extremely low on health. The cleric, having just been spared from death, rests his head on the floor. I need break. Rogue sits next to him and grabs his neck. I swear, if one more bloody thing bites me, I'm going to lose it. Just then, the party hear shouting in the outside corridor. The paladin and the fighter sprint towards the door, axes at the ready. The paladin slowly peeks through the door, seeing a trio of grim the knights standing in the corridor, weapons raised, yelling at each other. He's dead. I know you felt it too. Go in there and check them. And so what if he is? We didn't exactly follow him out of loyalty. You're a coward then. The one being insulted raises a short sword, but before he can even act, the other one gets in close and snaps his neck with one powerful wrench to the side. The third vampire spawn stands back, arms raised in a surrender pose. If Highwater's dead, I'm taking over. Get the others. We're going to swarm those lizard folk as soon as we have enough numbers. The paladin closes the door as silently as he can and walks back to the group, fighter close behind. They're going to storm in here and kill us all if we don't do something. They've gone wild out there. The rogue looks up. They're killing each other? The paladin nods. It's going to be a mad scramble for power and quite frankly, I don't want to be here when it goes down. Sorcerer, if take high water place, what point kill him? The paladin sighs. Because none of those monsters will ever come close to his power. As soon as word gets out that high water's dead, a lot of angry people will be coming to get a piece of their revenge. Fighter looks at all. Can stop get it. But fight way out. Sorcerer immediately shakes his head. We let grow number. We die. We fight now. Whole table stares at him like he's insane. We might escape if few guard. No fight unless have to. Rogue points out that he doesn't have spell slots and both the cleric and paladin are extremely low. Sorcerer gives a small smile and pulls a small bag out of his backpack. He holds up the sticks. I know five. Two heal. One protect. One necromancy. One unknown. We use get out. The rogue looks at him but shrugs. If you can heal us, go ahead. The sorcerer nods and looks at the sticks, identifying one that heals. He holds it between his hands. He snaps it. A wave of light emanates from the remains of the stick, sending energy into the party's bodies. Mass cure wounds. The sorcerer rolls, and is happy to find he rolls fairly well. Everybody heals 17 HP. He looks at the stick bag and pulls out the second healing one. If use, no heal. The fighter pushes his hand down. Save emergency. The sorcerer nods and puts the stick back into the bag. The party, now slightly healed, walk towards the door. Paladin looks at everyone while holding the handle. When this door opens, run, and don't stop running. With that, he opens the door, surprising the four vampire spawns waiting outside. The fighter sprints forward, slamming his axe into one's jaw before it can even react. The paladin steps out and swings his own axe, burying into a vampire spawn's chest before shoving it aside. 
The rest of the party begin sprinting down the corridor, even as the Grim the Knights get over their shock. The Paladin is slashed across the chest, but responds by kicking the vampire to the floor. The fighter takes two hits before he shoves the knight to the floor and takes off after the party. And so the dumbest chase in all my years of DMD began. Sprinting down corridors, turning at every opportunity, the party barely kept ahead of their pursuers. The rogue, unable to keep up with his larger allies, would frequently pause behind a doorway and kneecap anyone who came through with his sword before sprinting off again. Their rolls were impeccable, and their sheer luck was insane. Nat 20s flowed like a river and the enemies couldn't seem to land a single hit on them, even if they got close. At one point, a Grim the Knight grabbed the sorcerer and threw him through a table. The sorcerer got to his feet and snapped the necromancy stick. The vampire spawn was overwhelmed by necrotic energy and stumbled back, nearly dead. Which is when the rogue came running into the room, finishing him off with a quick stab to the chest. There was no feasible way they should have lasted as long as they did. The dice gods had deemed that today, the rising sun were to escape Nox for keep nearly unscathed, and there was next to nothing I could do to stop them. Until they reached the exit of the main keep. The party, seeing the heavy doors in sight, sprinted forward, not noticing the lack of guards until it was too late. They went to push the door open, only to find it sealed shut. The paladin and fighter began frantically taking their axes to it, before they heard a low chuckle behind them. They turned, seeing a parade of nearly 12 vampire spawns behind them, having effectively caught the party in an inescapable trap. A single Grim the Knight stepped forward, clapping sarcastically. The paladin recognized him as the one that had gone rogue first. It's impressive that you got this far, but this chase ends here. Several of the Grim the Knights raised a variety of polyomes, and lowered the points to face the party. The rogue steps forward. Come on man, you don't have to do this. It's been a long day, high water is dead, we can all go our separate ways. The vampire laughs. Yes, you killed high water, again you have me impressed, but quite frankly, you are outmatched here. At this point, the cleric raises his battle axe. You know understand. We rising sun. We kill many your kind. Kill you too. The vampire sighs. Kill them. The vampire spawn rush forward. Polyam's lowered. The fighter dodges a spear, swinging an axe at the person who attacked him. The paladin slams his axe into the side of a vampire's neck. Nat 20. Last smart. Second level. The vampire yells out and drops to his knees, where the paladin finishes him off with a blow to the head. The party take a flurry of spear hits, dropping almost everyone below 10 HP. The rogue cuts open the leg of a vampire spawn before slashing at his body. The cleric pulls a vampire spawn close and bites into his neck, tearing out a piece of flesh before swinging his axe, which briefly ignites into flames just before the impact. The sorcerer looks at me. I'm going to snap the unknown stick. Party stare at him. I stare at him. I roll some die and look at a table. As he snaps the stick, his eyes widen as he realizes what type of magic was stored inside. Wild magic. The fight stops as the sorcerer begins to glow with a bright blue energy. The party gather around him as he holds out his hands, casting all of them in the same blue light. And everyone sees black. The party open their eyes, and as they look around, they realize that they don't recognize the land around them. Sand crunches beneath their feet, and the sound of crashing waves echoes in their ears. They look around, seeing themselves on a tiny island, surrounded by endless open water in every direction. The rogue turns to the sorcerer who is looking around him and taking in their new environment. What did he do? The sorcerer looks down at his hands, where the remaining parts of the sticks lie. He holds them up. I broke. The paladin takes a few steps up a small incline, and he realizes he can already see the other side of the island. Where are we? At that point, they hear the faintest sound of a paddle in water. They turn, seeing a skiff coming towards them, a tall man in shining armor standing in it, a long paddle in his hands. They raise their weapons but he seems unbothered by their reaction and continues to row forward. Defying all logic and physics, the boat comes to a sudden stop, 
hardly a meter away from the sand, and stays perfectly still, despite the waves buffeting it. The rogue, of course, is the first to open his mouth. Who the fck are you? The man turns to him, and the rogue notices that his eyes lack pupils, instead shining with a full, golden light. I am nameless. I am merely one who watches and performs their task. The paladin steps forward. And what is your purpose? The man looks at him. To guide all who end up here. The cleric, a bit unsettled, raises his voice. Guide where? The man raises a hand and gestures to the horizon. Beyond. The sorcerer steps forward, broken stick still in his hands. Are we dead? The man shakes his head. You are not dead. Nor are you alive. You are here, and therefore nowhere. You were here before, are now, and will be in the future. You are between all, free from all. Paladin, what is this place? The man pauses. It is known by many names, however, you may know it best as Limbo. The rogue pauses. Limbo? As in the plane of existence Limbo? The man nods. The rogue looks around him and frowns. Always thought it would look different. The man raises his arm and gestures to the land they stand on. Limbo cannot be viewed by mortals. Your mind cannot comprehend its chaos, so you tend to create a land for yourself. Fighter, not all look different go. The man points to the sorcerer. That is because you are here by his doing, and thus, are spectators to what he sees. The paladin frowns. So where would you guide us? Back to the material plane? If you so desire. The rogue shrugs. Then what are we doing? Let's go. He steps into the water, but as he goes to climb into the boat, he blinks and finds himself back on the sand, as if he had never left. What? The man holds out his hand. My passage is not free. To leave Limbo, you must make an offering. Something of worth. The fighter thinks for a moment, and after pausing, holds up his new axe. The work? The man takes the axe and they watch as it crumbles to dust in his hands, the fragments swirling away before disappearing into thin air. Taking that as a yes, the fighter steps into the water, and as he goes to climb into the boat, isn't pulled back. The sorcerer thinks for a moment before passing over the bag of sticks, much to the party's disagreement. He climbs aboard, and they notice him holding something in his left hand, as if he had originally planned to give it up, but had changed his mind. The paladin pauses before slowly unbuckling his armor. He holds it in front of him, tracing his fingers over the engraving carved on front. Sighing, he hands it up, and this too, disappears. He climbs aboard. The rogue gun sheathes a dagger and hands it up, moving to climb onto the boat. He's pulled back not adequate. The man throws the dagger back onto the beach. The rogue sighs and hands up his crossbow instead, which allows him to climb aboard. Which finally leaves the cleric. The cleric pauses for a long time. Finally, he reaches into his leaf bag, but instead of pulling out a leaf as the party expect, he instead pulls out a large tooth, a thin piece of cord tied through it. He holds it in his hand for a moment before seeming to resolve himself to giving it up. He passes it to the man, who looks at it for a brief moment before the necklace fades from existence. The cleric nods and climbs aboard. The man turns around, holding the paddle above the water. Choose your destination mortals, or remain in limbo for eternity. The rogue looks at the others, waiting for them to nod reassurance before he turns to the man. It a cap point. The man nods and dips the paddle into the water. He paddles once, and the party lurch back further into the boat as they're propelled forward at inhumane speeds. The speed gets faster and faster as they travel, and the rogue, barely able to keep his head up, tries to look above the wooden sides of the boat. His wiry hair whipping about and his eyes streaming with tears, he sees the horizon in front of him. The horizon that is somehow getting closer. He lets go of the sides and holds his hands over his face as they hit the horizon. The party open their eyes to find themselves still in the boat, but as they look around, the man is gone. Wide-eyed from the adrenaline of the ride, the party are startled from their state when they hear a series of shouts. They look up, seeing that they are floating in a dock, a huge crowd of people staring at them. 
A human man throws a rope onto the boat and the fighter absentmindedly catches it. They're pulled towards the dock, where they're helped out of the boat. The paladin steps onto the dock first, where he's met by a wall of shocked expressions. The cleric, fighter and sorcerer all climb onto land, until finally, the rogue steps onto dry land. He looks around at the rest of the party, who appear very uncomfortable to be the center of so much attention. Holy shit we're alive. That's when he hears a small voice behind him. Turks? He turns, seeing an older goblin man. Turks is that really you? The rogue looks at him and slowly walks over. The two embrace before the man takes a step back, holding him at arm's length. He looks him up and down and a smile glows across his face. I thought I'd never see you again. The rogue is almost too shocked to speak. The others? The man smiles. They're okay. I got them out. The rogue pauses. How many? The goblin smile fades slightly. Seven others got out. The rogue takes a second to breathe. I thought I was the only one. The man laughs. So did we. Suddenly, he looks over the rogue's shoulder at the four lizard folk behind him. Bruised, scratched and with deep claw marks running down his face in the cleric's case, they are not the vision of good health. Who are they? The rogue turns and smiles. They're my friends. They saved my life and they helped me do it. Do what? The rogue pauses before a huge grin comes onto his face. Killed high water. The goblin freezes. My ears must be failing me. Did you say killed high water? The rogue's smile never fails. Suddenly, the goblin hugs in tight before turning to the crowd. High water is dead. After taking a moment to process the information, the crowd burst into a roar of celebration and cheering. The rogue turns to the party and holds out the goblin. Lizard folk, meet Wax. He was the chief of our home village. The paladin extends a hand. Pleasure to meet you Wax. My name is Curate. Wax earnestly takes his hand before turning to the rest of the party. The rogue pushes his hand down. Don't bother, they're not exactly keen on the whole civilization thing. However, cutting him short is the fighter, stepping forward and extending a hand. He keeps his hand at a flat, extremely odd angle, and simply holds it out straight as if he isn't sure what to do. Wax reluctantly takes it and almost has his arm torn off as the fighter shakes it violently. And Chask. Good meat. The fighter, not even waiting for a response looks at the paladin and tilts his head, as if waiting for some form of reassurance. The paladin gives him a smile before shooting an apologetic look at Wax. Wax turns to the rogue and gives him an odd look. It seems like you have quite the story to tell. Game ends. Well guys hope you enjoy today's video. We are going to assume you have if you have stayed to the end. Consider subscribing and clicking the notification bell if you really enjoyed it to stay up to speed with any and all new videos. Also check out the links below to our shop for some fat ass titties and our sponsor Rural and be sure to use a promo code at checkout so they know we sent you and you'll get 10% off. And until next time.